Welcome back to uh, the start of the afternoon session. Um, I'm going to do a brief uh, introduction and then pass it off to our moderator, Beverly Gage. Um, as you can see from the description in your program, this panel centers on the societal context in which co-education occurred, including society's expectations for women, the expectations women had for themselves, and the culture of the all-male institution we were joining. As you well know, many things that strike a younger audience is odd about how Yale welcomed the first women undergraduates from the facilities to the traditions to the certain limitations on where, when, or what a woman could do or be um, were very much standard thinking in the world outside of Yale. Um, so one really can't make sense of Yale's transition to coeducation without putting it in the appropriate context. Um, we hope this panel will provide a thoughtful discussion of those years before Yale went co-ed and when the women first came to campus. And will it assess what all of that meant for women in the late, uh, in the US in the late 1960s. Many of our mothers hoped we would not follow in their footsteps and instead wished for us the opportunities they were denied. Um, so I'm going to um, turn it over to Beverly, but first give you a little um, intro on her. And uh, as you can see in your program too, the, the full bios uh, are listed there, so we're only gonna list a few of the highlights. Um, Beverly Gage, class of 94, is professor of 20th century American history and director of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy. Her courses focus on American politics, political thought, social movements, and governance broadly conceived. In addition to her Yale BA, she holds a PhD in history from Columbia. So please welcome Beverly Gage. Well, thank you all. Are the microphones in better shape? First and most important question, okay. That's wonderful to hear. Um, thank you all, first of all, for being here, and thank you to the organizers, Eve Rice especially, who did so much work to put this panel together. And I also want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of you on behalf of uh, the slightly younger generations of women Yale students who followed in your footsteps, uh, who would not have been able to have the experiences that we had without your bravery, uh, hard work, adventurism, um, and also on behalf of the women faculty here at Yale. I was at this morning's session and I appreciated the conversation and advocacy on our behalf. Um, I should say, looking out at this audience, it's kind of a thrill to be up here. At, during the Yale reunions in May, I was a speaker at the class of 1969 reunion. It looked very different from this. So this is a real triumph. It's really remarkable to sit up here and see all of you out there. And uh, it's just wonderful that this event is happening. Um, our task up here for this panel is to draw back a little bit from Yale-centric discussions and think about how all of your experiences uh, and the experiences of the institution and the broader community of New Haven fit into some larger political, social, cultural, intellectual dynamics that were underway uh, during the late 1960s and early 1970s. As a history professor, I teach a class in 20th century American history here, so we cover a lot of this ground. I spend a lot of time teaching this as history uh, to the next generation of students who I should note, somewhat disturbingly, even for me, were now born in the 21st century. Um, so this year's freshmen and sophomores were all 21st century babies. So all of the 20th century, um, including my own undergraduate experiences, of course, 
uh, yours, um, is now uh, very much part of history for them. Um, and when we talk about history, I actually often point back to this moment in the late 60s and early 70s when students come to me with the question of whether or not we've lived through anything like what we're living through today, but in particular, whether we have ever lived in a society that was as divided um, and as full of political passion as uh, the world into which they are entering. And of course, there are lots of differences between uh, this moment and 50 years ago, but I think there are some really interesting and telling similarities too. And so that's part of our challenge today is to talk about what some of those might be. Um, just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, 1969 through the early 1970s, so Richard Nixon had just been uh, elected president. We were at really the peak of the Vietnam War, as well as the controversies over the Vietnam War. Um, the civil rights movement had been underway for well over a decade in its formal sense. Um, and in many ways, uh, by the late 1960s, we were entering a moment of really new radical consciousness for the anti-war movement, uh, for uh, the civil rights movement, for many other identity movements that were beginning to emerge. Um, one of the most interesting things that I've been thinking about in 1969 was uh, sort of the parallel story to that, which is a book that was written by a man named Kevin Phillips in 1969 titled The Emerging Republican Majority. And uh, it was sort of laying out what he saw, despite all of this radicalization, despite all of this energy uh, that seemed to be happening on the left and within liberal circles, um, he foresaw a radical reordering of politics on the American right as well. And that's become increasingly for historians a big theme of uh, the 1960s and 1970s. And of course, for people who were uh, teenagers and in their early 20s, these were both uh, thrilling years and I would imagine terrifying years in lots of ways. Uh, 1968 saw the assassinations of Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Uh, you were seeing increasing violence in many American cities. Uh, and of course, in 1970, you really saw dramatic ruptures on many campuses in the United States. Um, I'm sure every Everyone in this room has uh, some memory of May Day 1970, and that might be one of the touchstone events we'd like to talk about here. Uh, but of course, 1970 was the year of the Kent State shootings, uh, the shootings of student protesters at Jackson State in Mississippi as well. Um, so if we had to boil it down, I think we might think about uh, the period in which you all arrived at Yale as a period of enormous promise and change, um, a period of pretty serious uh, instability and uh, divisiveness as well. And so uh, we wanna think about the experiences of everyone in this room, but particularly our distinguished panelists in that vein. So to turn to our panelists, I'm gonna briefly introduce each of them at turn. Uh, we'll have a conversation up here for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then as with the panel this morning, we will open it up for questions and answers. Um, I suppose we can go from, uh, from that end of the table to this one. Uh, we'll start with uh, Congressman Sheila Jackson Lee, um, who is a 1972 graduate. Don't start with you. I'm yielding to my sisters. So All right, she's, she's busy. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce you in that order and then we'll start somewhere else. Uh, a 1972 graduate of Yale College. She is in her 11th term in the United States House of Representatives representing. <laughs> representing the 18th Congressional District of Texas, uh, which is centered around Houston. Um, you might know her if you're an avid C-SPAN fan, but you might also uh, see her very frequently uh, speaking out in, uh, in, in the name of truth and justice on uh, many television programs um, and elsewhere, one of our most uh, influential and really prolific uh, legislators today. Um, next, we have Dr. Laura Wexler, who is uh, my colleague here at Yale, professor of women's gender and sexuality studies and American studies. Um, she is an expert on American culture in the present and in the past, particularly on uh, women's culture, women's history, feminism, as well as photography, film, media studies, ethnicity, race and migration, public humanities. Uh, professor Wexler is one of those people who seems to have her fingers uh, in many, many here at Yale, uh, which is wonderful for all of us. 
Um, also here at Yale, I'd like to introduce Linda Greenhouse, um, who is currently, uh, uh, who's a 1978 graduate of Yale Law School, um, and since 2009 has been here as the Joseph Goldstein Lecturer in Law. Um, she spent 40 years plus at the New York Times reporting on uh, the law and on the Supreme Court. She received a Pulitzer Prize for her work there. Uh, she is the author of many books, including a recent memoir, uh, which might be uh, worth uh, checking out for all the personal details uh, in there. And I'm sorry to say that she has also been a member of the Harvard University Board of Overseers, <laughs> but uh, that's the one blot on I her resume. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, we have uh, Dr. Virginia Dominguez. Uh, Dr. Dominguez is a 1973 graduate of Yale College and a 1979 PhD from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she is the Edward William and Jane Marr Gut School Professor of Anthropology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, she is an expert uh, on the United States in a global context in thinking about uh, how we might tell American history and other histories through a lens that is not simply centered in the United States, uh, but looks much more broadly at what the rest of the world thinks of the United States um, and how uh, Americans might think about the world. Uh, she's the author of many books, including most recently, America Observed on an International Anthropology of the United States. And finally, we have Dr. Nancy Vickers, who is a 1976 PhD from the Graduate Graduate School of Arts and Sciences here. She was the seventh president of Bryn Mawr College, uh, I think must have many reflections on co-education and its promise and perils. Uh, while she was here at Yale, she was for two years a member of the University Committee on Co-Education at Yale. She's also a distinguished scholar of, uh, of literature and of language. Um, she's written many books as well, a new history of French literature among them. So please join me in welcoming these panelists. So I thought we might start out with this question of how much when you were here at Yale, um, you were thinking about this broader scope. When historians think back about the past, we tend to have this very high level view. We think about Richard Nixon and the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement. And of course, those things intersect with people's lived experiences, uh, but to some degree, uh, they don't intersect with them at all in some cases, particularly 18 year olds. And of course, up here, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about where we were in terms of feminist consciousness in terms of women's consciousness um, at that moment. So um, maybe, uh, Dr. Dominguez, do you want to start us off since you have both the, the global scale of, uh, of thinking about this and the personal experience? I will do my best. Was this, I was here this morning and the microphones were not working. Let me do what you did. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm probably most unusual here and not necessarily for uh, what you said about us. But I really didn't live in the U.S. for the four years prior to starting. And so um, some of the things I remember were pressure. I desperately try not to flunk out of Yale. Um, I, I remember a lot of my friends and colleagues going on marches in Washington, because I remember the Vietnam War well. But I was actually not living in the U.S. at the time. I went to high school, as, as I think at least some of you know, I went to high school in Montevideo to an all-girls Catholic school. <laughs> um, so what I remember was I actually watched the landing on the moon in Guadalajara, Mexico with my mother on TV. I mean, I, act, I remember that vividly. Uh, I don't remember various other things. I do remember becoming an agnostic. I said I went to a Catholic girls' school. I remember becoming an agnostic when I was about 14. Uh, the principal of the school actually loved that. Uh, she then went on to become a union organizer and <laughs> social worker after I graduated. So, you know, I was sort of following in her footsteps, but little did I know. Was I a feminist? I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. I cannot remember. Did I become a feminist while I was here? Yes. 
was I a feminist beforehand? I don't know, but it never occurred to me that, frankly, that Yale and or Princeton would take so long to accept women because it made no sense. Um, I do remember Nixon. <laughs> I was really delighted to hear the results of the survey this morning because I can say some things now that I wasn't sure I could say. <laughs> um, I remember Nixon. I actually was in graduate school when Nixon was forced to resign. You remember that? I wasn't, it wasn't college, it was afterwards. Um, I remember, I actually remember uh, the U.S. being both male-dominated and white-dominated um, quite strongly, but my goal was really just to survive and not flunk. So, well, congratulations Thank for doing you. that. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's 50 years later. Yeah, um, I still remember that. Uh, Congressman Jackson Lee, reflections on politics then and now. I mean, were you, so I teach in a program that is, uh, attracts many very ambitious Yale students who are willing to say pretty early on, you know, I want to grow up to be Secretary of State. And they know that now. And that's what they're doing. And it's great. It's a little terrifying. I was not that kind of Yale student. Were you, were you that kind of Yale student? You said, I'm going to Congress. And I'm thinking about politics in this moment. Well, thank you very much. And let me first of all say how humbled I am to be here uh, with my sisters. Uh, we use that terminology in the United States Congress for our fellow <laughs> sisters in the United States Congress. And if I might simply as I look, uh, see the utter power that is in this room. So Yale, I do not want you to be particularly protective of this list because I'd like to engage with my sisters who are willing to do so. I think that this is amazing. So I just had to get that out. And if you're ready to do like Marion Wright Edelman said, um, a Yale Law graduate who said, uh, you can change the world if you really care. And I've just met so many of you think we can still change the world. I was um, extremely naive, uh, so I think I culturally represented um, the public school crowd, um, but also um, some of us a sheltered crowd, even coming from the big city of New York, which is where I was born and raised. Uh, my first year was at Washington Square. I guess I'm not going to give my biography, but let me just quickly say at NYU, um, and uh, we were in the midst of a shutdown uh, that first year as freshmen. Um, and all I could think of is my very loving but stern parents seeing me dragged off in handcuffs uh, and in New York in the protests. And so, um, you know, I kind of protested and then snuck back in the building to tell the professor I will get their work in. Um, <laughs> So I, I had, so I, I did have, I was uh, um, an, I, an idealist. Uh, I was someone who was formulated by the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. I never got a chance to meet him, but I got to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as soon as I, I could. I was asked uh, to speak at uh, Juanita Abernathy's funeral on Monday. Uh, unfortunately, another of our colleagues uh, wife died, it's the exact same day. But what I'm saying, I was very idealistic. And so uh, the small newspaper article in the, anybody remember the New York Daily News? Back then was the working man's paper, working man, working woman's paper, that said they're opened up for Yale. And I really thought that I was going for, uh, you know, a, a, um, a mission. I was going to pioneer. Really didn't know what I was formulating, but I knew that I was going to get in the civil rights movement and I was going someplace that would help formulate me. So the backdrop of the, of the movement, of the black power movement, all of that was raging at the time. Now, on the, on the idealistic and naive point and the humorous point, and I told Gary this, um, he tries to argue me down that they weren't here, but when I, when I drove up, when I, when I drove up uh, to the campus, and many of us should remember that day, the class of 72, 71, 72, and 73, um, uh, the, um, with all of the excitement and uh, not teary-eyed, well, teary-eyed family members and the whole clan came. It's like three cars 
<laughs> um, but in any event, with every clothing in my possession and uh, trunks and suitcases, uh, and I promise you, I promise you there was a group of men, and I laughed. I mean, I guess the uh, survey that was taken, and I'll end on this note, we are really take charge folks. So even at, at, at 19, which I was, I really didn't get offended. I really thought it was humorous, but they had this big gigantic sign, class of 70, last male class. And they were waving and I was waving and I just didn't get the, the magnitude of their conviction. To make, a long, <laughs> to make a long story short, I viewed Yale um, with the challenges of being a woman, uh, first a woman of color, uh, a budding um, uh, social activist, um, as uh, finessing and sharpening my skills. Uh, it was the first time I was off on my own, and I think many of my fellow students were, particularly women, uh, the first time that we got confronted with uh, sexism. Um, and maybe we developed as a feminist, or we developed as a, uh, as a, a powerful uh, civil rights activist, black power, whatever we crafted it to be, political scientist, lawyer, but in any event, it's the place where I face the reality that everything will not be in a beautifully wrapped package and that you really are going to have to fight for it. And, my, and, and I, forgive me, we say this a lot, my sisters, it, it is truly that part of Yale um, that I think has given many of us um, the um, grit uh, to be where we are today, no matter what we might have opted to do. And I diminish nothing that Yale women became because I know what Yale women, girls, young women went through to be here. Mm -hmm. So, um, Dr. Vickers, in our correspondence, uh, as we were thinking about issues that might come up on the panel or be worth talking about. Um, you emphasized the idea that actually this wasn't a moment necessarily when women had outsized expectations for what they could achieve. It wasn't actually a moment uh, where uh, girls, young women were coming into an institution like this expecting that they could do many of the things uh, that later generations thought that they could do. So I wonder if you could reflect upon uh, your experience on that and particularly um, what the graduate school told you about the role that you were going to be expected to play in the world. Yes, that's quite a story. Um, let me say, I went to undergraduate school. Can you hear me? Are we? Okay. Went to undergraduate school in 1963, Mount Holyoke College, graduated in 1967. So I'd like to say that I went to college in the 1950s, but I graduated in the 1970s. <laughs> and uh, so consequently, it was a time of very rapid change, but I came into it as the daughter of a working class immigrant family that had worked its way to the middle class. And uh, so consequently, it came with a lot of expectations of young women. And uh, what was, you know, what I was sharing with Beverly, there was a degree to which I had internalized uh, these requirements so deeply that I was, in essence, not even really understanding that I myself was, though, outside the box enough to go to college and to go to graduate school that I was bringing with me baggage uh, and just embedded in me uh, kinds of baggage that it would take many, many years, and indeed I doubt that I'm still all the way out of them. Although I have to say, Dartmouth turned me into a real feminist. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, most of all, um, uh, my sense was that uh, it was expected that I would get married. Uh, the young women who were going in 1963 thought there were two purposes to going to college, one of which was to get an education, and the other of which was to get a husband. And the purpose of the education was to be, in large part, a more educated, uh, successful, uh, talented mother. And uh, if, for example, uh, uh, if you made your way into that uh, particular system, uh, you found yourself making curious selections around things like majors. Now I, my SAT scores would have suggested science and uh, mathematics. I majored in French. 
perfume and fashion. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm being silly, but not entirely. <laughs> and, uh, and so consequently, that, you know, that was the direction I started moving in. I had the wits to think that I really could do something with this because I was directing myself at becoming a teacher. Now, I wanted to be a college teacher, which forced me to do advanced degrees, but I was falling into the sort of laundry list of what were the expected professions for women uh, as a teacher, as a nurse, as a volunteer, as uh, someone with secretarial expertise. There is a moment that I can't resist recounting, and I may even say the name of the school that's involved in it. When I was applying to college, I was applying to two of the women's schools on the uh, East Coast. I came from Detroit. And uh, in the midst of applying to those two schools on the East Coast, uh, one of them, Smith, sent two, <laughs> sent two of its alumni to my middle class family home in Royal Oak, Michigan. And, um, and so they came in, they were checking me out, they were checking the parents out, they were checking the carpeting out. And, uh, <laughs> And so my father, in a moment that I will never forget, I mean, it for me is the most extraordinary moment about knowing who my father really was, uh, looked up, having been very quiet through all of this, and said, so tell me, what do Smith graduates do when they graduate from Smith? And the answer was, they go to Katie Gibbs. <laughs> this from a women's college. <laughs> so... Uh, Yes, I know, it's a shocker, and Pleasure in and all pleasure. fairness, I have to say, this is the school Pleasure. that brought you Gloria Steinem, so don't, <laughs> it's not that it wasn't a complex place, uh, and so I think that, you know, what Beverly was mentioning is just that there was so much to overcome in terms of growing out of this. I think the critical moment, uh, <coughs> going back to what you were saying just a bit earlier, was that turn uh, uh, at the moment of the co-education of the Ivies, which is a sort of very complex set in negative ways and positive ways, and then uh, the real sort of explosion of uh, the women's movement in the early 1970s, which uh, surrounded as it was by some of the extraordinary moments of the co-education of schools like Yale and like Dartmouth, uh, where I spent 14 years taking them through co-education, uh, it, uh, it uh, was truly shocking. Now, questions about graduate school. Uh, one of the things that was very surprising about Yale graduate school when I was in it, and um, is simply that some of the most talented professors, uh, the most encouraging professors, the people who thought the most of my work, would also say things that were just truly surprising. Uh, for example, there was one who at every cocktail party would come up and say, well, you're doing so well, isn't that grand? But of course, you know, the women uh, get married and their careers basically end when they get married, so it's just sad. Uh, and, and this was a department where 60% of the students were women. Uh, and I think I see Sam Chauncey in the background. Is that Sam Chauncey? Hi, Sam. It's hi. One of my heroes. Uh, at a panel way back then when I was on the University Committee on Coeducation, I described a fellowship in the French department where 60% of the students were women. And uh, that fellowship was an exchange program with the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. So they sent a Normalien to Yale, and Yale sent a Normalien to Paris. Every year, that was a man. It was restricted to the male students. Parenthetically, the Ecole Normale Supérieure is not restricted <laughs> to men's students. Uh, and uh, so having announced this at some broad panel where we were supposed to be making, I think, probably a good impression, uh, I told this story, and Sam fixed it instantly. <laughs> so I'll just wrap up there, but I do think, um, you know, we have to, I am constantly reading in myself the sort of drag on my own forward-moving, aspirational, uh, energy, and, uh, and I think as the generations go by, I hope we're shedding all of that. Mm -hmm. Linda, 
you had some, I guess, similar reflections in your writing about your, uh, your undergraduate years at Harvard. Um, so I, I wonder if you might build off that, but then also speak a little bit about how those kinds of things began to change and the role that the law, um, these were of course years of some rather significant um, Supreme Court decisions in uh, the history of uh, women's reproductive freedom um, as well as in other areas. So I wonder if you might reflect on those. Yeah, so, so my experience is a little bit different, although I have a Yale degree. It was a degree from here as a, on a mid-career fellowship. I was 10 years out of college. So I went to the other place. I went to Radcliffe uh, because I was too old to apply to Yale. I'm a townie. I went to Hampton High School just up the road. And the guys went to Yale, and the women made their way to other places. So uh, women at Harvard in those days were 20% of the undergraduate body. It was capped. We were admitted by Radcliffe. We were housed by Radcliffe. We were fed by Radcliffe. Harvard really didn't want much to do with us. They had to teach us. The classes were co-ed. But the social life was very segmented because the tuition and room and board, well, the tuition went to Harvard, but the room and board went to Radcliffe. And we were really uh, you know, second-class citizens in many ways. Many opportunities were closed to us in terms of uh, even access to various things on campus, uh, postgraduate fellowships, and so on. And as I uh, told Beverly in our earlier uh, communication, what's remarkable looking back on that was how little any of us had in the way of any kind of developed feminist consciousness. Because the message was, you know, we were lucky to be there, and we knew that great and cataclysmic events were going on in the country and the world. I mean, we were very, very conscious of Vietnam because the guys were subject to the draft. This was pre-lottery. Just everybody was going to be drafted unless they could find some other way. And we were certainly very conscious of the civil rights movement. And neither of those things had anything to do, as far as we could tell, with women. Our story wasn't, wasn't visible at all. And to the extent that we thought we were being treated unfairly, and I, and I did think so, and I wrote for the Harvard Crimson, and I wrote many editorials about, you know, let us into Lamont, the undergraduate library. Let us do this. Let us do that. It was, we were being treated unfairly as Radcliffe students. We should have the same access that you guys do. Not that we were being treated unfairly as women. Kind of, it, it sounds weird to say that. I mean, maybe you all understand this, but... You know, I have a 35-year-old daughter. She, this is not, this doesn't resonate, uh, you, you know, w with, with her. So, you know, I think that's one thing to say. And uh, I didn't really kind of have a, a consciousness of any of that until I went out into the world of work. And it was kind of interesting. I didn't want to go to graduate school. The assumption at Radcliffe was that you would go to some kind of graduate school, um, not law school, not maybe medical school more than law school, uh, but arts and sciences or something. And my deans were um, quite amazed when I said, actually, I'm going to go get a job. And I got a job at the New York Times. And uh, very soon after that, uh, the older women at the Times, and there weren't many of them, but the ones who were there were very fabulous, uh, had banded together to file one of the early uh, Title VII sex discrimination lawsuits. And maybe um, if you saw the Amazon Prime show about the women of Newsweek, Good Girls Revolt, Newsweek had, had the women at Newsweek had sort of cut the ice there and the Times was following. Um, and we were represented by um, a wonderful woman named Harriet Rabb, who was, uh, you know Harriet? Um, who was a young uh, law professor at Columbia and she had a sex discrimination clinic workshop. And she was the first female lawyer I had ever met. And I thought, wow, this is really, you know, there's another way to be in the world. Uh, and, and just the being part of the class uh, that was bringing this lawsuit was a very, you know, consciousness raising uh, kind of thing. And then, you know, it did, it did kind of clue me into paying attention to law and to what was developing out in the world, and I was one of a handful of 
young women in the newsroom, uh, and I got some very interesting assignments, and I got assigned uh, maybe the second year I was there uh, to cover a press conference announcing uh, a lawsuit against New York State uh, for the right to abortion. And that was um, one of many such lawsuits that was going on. One of them would eventually come to be called Roe against Wade. And this lawsuit never actually got to court because the New York legislature changed the law and the, uh, the lawsuit became moot. But it got me into the discourse about abortion. Uh, and they asked me to write a piece for the Times Sunday Magazine. I knew no law, no law whatsoever. But I found these great women who were in civil rights law around the city who took the trouble to educate me. And I wrote a piece for the Times Magazine and the headline was, and it's, it's been widely anthologized is how I know it, um, constitutional question, is there a right to abortion? And uh, of course, I argued the answer was yes. And this was 1971. Roe against Wade was two years away. But it you know, kind of brought me into a a consciousness of, of activism that I have to say in my undergraduate years was um, totally missing. So undergraduate years uh, and women's studies, I mean, how are today's students taught in the context of women's studies and women's history about this really critical period from the, the late 60s into the early 70s? What, what would you say is now kind of the standard narrative, and how did they think about it and respond to it? OK. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I want to start, actually. She brought a prop. <laughs> I have I, it's something I want to read to you from January 19th, 1968. I'm not a member of any of your class, but that's not because I didn't try. <laughs> this is from Miss Laura Kaplan, Sarah Lawrence College, Bronxville, New York, and that's to her, who that's, dear Miss Kaplan, we have received your recent inquiry and wish to let you know that at the present time, the only women admitted to the undergraduate programs in Yale College are the wives of Yale faculty members and the wives of Yale graduate students. Should you be interested later in applying for admission to one of the graduate or professional schools in Yale, you should write to the dean of the school in which you are interested for further information. Sincerely yours, John Muskins, Jr., Director of Admissions. Mm. This was weeks before admissions was open to women at Yale. Okay? <laughs> and my special advisor at Sarah Lawrence College, who was Jackie Matfeld, who later became president of Barnard, um, knew Elga Wasserman and knew this was coming. And actually, I'd had a lot of discussions with Jackie about it. So I knew that Yale was about to make this decision. And yet, the answer I got when I inquired about how to apply was not, well, just hold on for a few weeks. It was, well, you could marry a Yale man. <laughs> <laughs> or you could apply later when you're thinking about graduate school. And that seemed, it's not, it, he, it's not a joke. And I do now have a Yale degree because I, when I became, if you become a tenured professor at Yale, you get a Yale degree. You can't be a tenured professor at Yale without a Yale degree, <laughs> right? Yeah. Only the best and the greatest, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I put it on my door when I became chair of women's studies. Um, and co-chair of the Yale Faculty Forum. Um, and I intend to donate it to the history uh, archive here. But it, it frames how we were seen, okay? And that it seemed okay to answer an inquiry for admission uh, that way is kind of really important um, because it shows that for whatever one of these places here, elsewhere, that we went, we gained admission, but not really access, okay? Not really access. And it took years and years to learn what was the difference. So I want to answer the question of how I became a feminist in and around Yale, um, and then talk about the current students. I taught a wonderful seminar last year on co-educating Yale, and I'm 
we had an amazing discussions with the undergraduates now, and I want to say some of the things that they think and some of the ways that women's gender and sexuality, because it's no longer it's no longer women's studies, um, uh, handles this. But um, I became a feminist in and around Yale also, um, but it was in the fall of. 1969, um, when I came to a, a march um, to plan the rally in May, the Panthers rally in May. And this happened in late November of 1969. And um, there were um, a number of Panther women who were pregnant and who were in jail. Um, and the famous, and Linda, I'm forgetting the name of the Connecticut case on abortion. What's the name of the case? Uh, Abley against Markle. Had just been decided. Um, and there were a lot of feminists who were working on uh, questions of pregnancy discrimination, abortion, access to uh, contraception information. It feels like the, it feels like hundreds of years ago, but it wasn't. Um, and this group of people, the Panthers, the people around what would be the trial uh, in the spring, and the people involved in um, access to health, came together in the fall. The Panther women created what they called a women's brigade. And it was the first time in many years of marching for anti-war and civil rights that I ever marched that they take, took the women out of the general march and put us in front. And we marched as a women's brigade around New Haven, through the hill, through the green, and up to the steps of the courthouse. Okay, And we were chanting, obscenity, Yale, obs obscenity, Harvard, obscenity, Yale, get the Panthers out of jail, <laughs> all around it. Okay? And um, it was the exhilaration of that. Um, and the really kind of deep training by the women activists and the Panther women um, in that moment that gave me the name for what I already was. And it was the name feminism that allowed me to recognize myself as a feminist. It's not that I changed, it's that it got a category in the world. I subsequently lived my life in and around Yale and New Haven and I, I used to drive around the green for like years, like for 18 years, trying to figure out about a particular moment that happened. The women were on the steps of the courthouse at the end of this march. We were being, we were gleeful. We were exhilarated. We had found companions. There was going to be something to be done about this situation. And people were taking our pictures in front of us. And somebody pointed up to the left on a rooftop and said, look, are those guns or cameras? Whether or not there were sharpshooters on the roof, whether or not there were guns or cameras aimed at us, we never knew. And I spent years driving around the green till I finally figured out why I couldn't reconfigure the geography of that moment and it was because the Connecticut Financial Center, they took, the, the building is gone and the Connecticut <laughs> Financial Center is there. So you can't recreate the geometry. But that moment was my deepest political education. And it happened in town, not in Yale. And it was directed by the Women Panthers and the activists from all over New England who came to try to figure out what to do about the women panthers who were pregnant and in jail. And I, what I would argue and what I try to do within women's studies here at Yale, women, gender, and sexuality studies, which is very important to recognize that that has changed, is give some permission for that wider world to happen within the university as well as outside of it. Aud uh, uh, Adrian Rich wrote an essay around that time towards a women-centered university, and it articulated what kind of university would have to come into being in order for there truly to be co-education. 
So the women students now, and the men students, and the uh, uh, people that are gender fluid and don't go by those designations, do not actually think that coeducation has happened. They think it's a work in progress, and they think that um, um, they still are not seen um, the way that they would like to be seen as the education part of the co, okay? Think about the word co-education. Co means together. And for much of the, that first year, there was a lot of debate about how the men and women students should or shouldn't or could or could be or not together. But it's the question of education that was really key. The question of what difference did it make not to Yale, not to the dorms, not to the bathrooms, but to the country that we were all here together. And I would argue that momentarily, for a short period of time, coeducation descended on Yale, on the green, for a little while, and then it left. That it appears occasionally when we are seen as citizens needing an education, rather than as men or women, or whatever else you want to be, uh, uh, trying to struggle about how we live together. So that's what, under my hand, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies um, tries to be about. People are yearning for this education. People are yearning to be seen as citizens together. And that's what I think it means. Great. Well, I want to pose one more question to the whole panel before we open it up uh, to the audience. Um, and that really is the comparative question that uh, I raised at the, uh, in my introductory remarks. Um, what can we learn about the present by looking back to this moment of, uh, of the late 1960s and early 1970s and really moving forth into the 1970s? Uh, the 1970s seems like a very paradoxical decade in retrospect in which you both got uh, really the rise of feminist consciousness, the rise of very powerful women's movement, um, changes in ideas about sexuality, uh, about sexual identity, um, liberation movements flowering. And then it was also a decade in which you saw a very powerful conservative movement taking hold, uh, really culminating in the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Um, these things were happening simultaneously. Uh, they were often clashing with each other. They were constituting each other. Um, and it seems that we may be back in, in, in a moment, uh, perhaps a little bit like that, uh, where you have powerful energies on all sides. Um, it's not clear, as it wasn't in the 70s, which of those energies uh, might win out. And I think for a while, we might have told uh, the story of the 60s into the 70s um, as a kind of progress story, as a simple progress story from a kind of liberal, uh, liberal perspective. Is that still how you think about those years? Um, but really this question of, of comparing then and now, and particularly what, do we, what we might take away from uh, this earlier moment that might tell us something about today. And uh, really anyone who wants to, to jump in on this. Can yeah, I Jane? jump in on this? This may not be what you want to hear, and there might be disagreement among us. Um, I think we, a lot of us were very, I don't know if the right word is naive, innocent. Some of us were 18 when we came in. You were 19, I was 17. Um, we really thought we were going to change the world, and I think a lot of that has to do with all of these other things also happening in the 60s. Um, as I tell my students now, and I'm still teaching, um, we probably exaggerated how much power we had then. They vastly underestimate how much power they have now. This is both the men and the women. I remember a year ago in a class I was teaching, there were about 50 students in the class, I said, I was getting more and more agitated. And I said, I said, okay, I was sort of talking about politics, power, et cetera. And I said, well, how many of you feel you have any power? No hand went up. I repeated, I said, no, 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 how about slightly? 
two guys, two men, mostly women in the class, two men raised their hands up to about here. And two out of this entire class. And I said, okay, let's start with you two. And one of them said, I, I think I have some power over myself. I don't have any power to affect anybody else or anything else. And the other one said, just like him. And that was it. So I don't know. I have taught in many universities, both in the US and abroad. Um, Yale may be different, but I don't think so, not in this way. The other thing I have noticed over the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years is more and more of the women students resist the label feminist. So they may say I'm a post-feminist, they may rephrase the question, do I believe that women should have all the rights and access, etc.? Yes. And I say, that doesn't make you a feminist? Nope. So uh, I, I don't know what to do with this. I actually think we're going backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you may not want to hear that, but I think we're going backwards. I've been in the academy my entire life. I think we're going backwards. Want to talk about that. No, I'm just, com I have to say that uh, every time I watch the news, I say to myself, good grief, here's what I worked for my whole life, and we're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't have much more to say than that, but it is uh, uh, truly uh, upsetting. I'm more upset and depressed. In the 60s and 70s, we had the sense that we could do something to fix it. And here I'm looking yep. at Congresswoman Lee. What she's trying. Down, yeah, and what she's trying to do. You know, and you hang in there <laughs> despite yeah. any amount of pushback, which is so admirable. But I just, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this, but I just wish I could have the same, maybe I was just younger, you know, who knows. But the kind of energy we had during those years around many, many important causes, uh, um, and feminism certainly being one of them, uh, it seems to me to be somehow lost, and I sense that we're moving backwards. Well, you've given me a, a very good <laughs> opening, um, and um, let me um, build on your words and Laura's words in terms of, and the moderator's words in terms of this comparative um, bubble that we're in. Um, I am, um, to build on what I said, coming in naive, but coming in uh, believing that I was going to be a tree shaker and a change maker in terms of having gotten into Yale in the first place from the very meager background that I came from. Um, I am, um, I, I built, she was, you were in uh, 69, we had not gotten there yet, but we were in 70, Laura, you were in spring of uh, 60. You were saying 69 or 70? I was here for the March, but the I, March. I graduated in 70. Right, but, but you were here from... Yes, you were, I was right. here. Yes. So I'm going to speak from 70, which was the um, time when the weathermen came, and it was in the backdrop of the Bobby Seal trial, as I recollect. Uh, and um, Kingman Brewster made the decision to keep the university open. Uh, for those of you in classes 71, uh, 72, and 73 was in the backdrop of students being killed at Kent State, literally shot dead on the campus. It could have been um, a catastrophic, um, as similar to 69, catastrophic implosion, uh, if you will. But we, many of my fellow women students who were in their own movement, myself who was in the Black Power Movement, when I say that, with the African American House, with the Black Students Association, um, and uh, you know, other uh, groups of color, Native Americans, etc. This became the center point of persons converging, uh, sort of the children of the great society who had benefited but yet hated Vietnam were all coming to this campus. I still maintained the sense that we were in the midst of change, uh, even though uh, Richard Nixon was president, we still had that hope uh, that we could diversify, we could get an African-American studies program, which we did. Yale should be very proud of being the mother 
of African American Studies and gave birth to Dr. Skip Lewis Gates, that many of you, Lewis Skip Gates, who uh, waywardly, he can, <laughs> he can uh, you can tell him I said waywardly went off to Harvard, but in any event, um, has an outstanding international and national program on history, but came out of, he came out of this. That was a male student, but I, what I'm saying is that I felt in our experience in that time, um, it was a changing time. Um, it was an explosive time. In your time, they were um, uh, marksmen that, <laughs> that we could see right on the campus. Uh, there was some dispute with my, one of my sisters here that said they were outside. I saw the, the National Guard on the inside, <laughs> meaning when I say that inside the, in, inside the parameter of, of our campus, standing side by side because they were expecting the wedding. And I, I use that description to say it was a colorful moment, uh, but it was a moment where we thought that we were there really driving the political change of the nation, mm -hmm. that we were standing up to what we thought was an unfair, unfair trial of a Black Panther. And I'm glad she talked about pregnant women. I, I do a lot of work on that, pregnant women incarcerated. Um, so for me, um, I was infused with change. Uh, and I was, uh, it was growing. Um, I was um, um, a uh, deacon uh, in the Yale church for the very reason just to hear Sloan Coffin talk about uh, the, the, the biblical connections, though he really was societal. Um, he helped me go and work for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And so uh, during the uh, summer breaks, you know, loaded with what happened in uh, the spring of 1970, loaded with that ready for change um, and uh, realizing that there were um, African-Americans, blacks in the South, in spite of this uh, Voting Rights Act, who were frightened and panicked about voting. And, and we went down to register people on plantation, which existed where sharecroppers were. I was infused with that spirit. Um, I think that, that um, we have a challenge because I compare uh, 69, mm -hmm. which may be um, uh, candy canes, um, bubbles in water, compared to where we are today. Um, and uh, this is a, an, an important moment and pause in the, the, the driving spirit that I have, uh, which I'd like to attribute to family, but I, I'd like to think it is to these moments that I had on this campus. Um, too bad that we had this long period of time we've all gone off when I look at the, the array of power, as I said, but um, I, I must get this in um, before the questioning. There is the toxicity that exists now, as I said before, that I don't know could even compare to 69. In 69, whether it was feminism or otherwise, it was in front of us and we said we can do something about it. Um, I think we have been as wonderful parents and adults, we probably have not been as constructive in infusing in that, 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 that rush uh, for those who are younger. That, let me give you the faith of Black Lives Matter. Let me give you the faith of March for Our Lives. Let me give you the faith of those who are now organizing as young as seven and eight and nine on climate change. There is something there. We shouldn't be so harsh on ourselves. But I do think what we still have the opportunity to do uh, is to remedy the fact that we're in 2019 and the Equal Rights Amendment has not yet been passed. So what were we doing, uh, just introducing it and introducing it? We can remedy the fact that although the preciousness and the little book called the Constitution uh, should be in everybody's purse, like Barbara Jordan taught me and Shirley Chisholm, uh, we, we're not. And so our faith uh, gets um, weakened when we see the massive reconstruct of what has been the model of democracy with all of its warts. And so what I would say is the comparison is that as we looked forward in 69, um, we basically were looking forward and saying, I know we can make a difference. Whatever our sphere was, it might not have been perfect. Uh, the treatment might not have been perfect, but I still had hope coming out of 69, 70, that we were going to be change makers in whatever we're doing. To compare it now, what I want to say to, uh, if we don't reignite uh, the fire, 
Um, the world is watching whether or not we are collapsing what they have come to know as a marker for democracy, for human rights, for the unempowered. Uh, one man, know that um, Yale gets sensitive, but one man uh, is trying to deconstruct. And he's deconstructing the treatment of women, the respect of women, the dignity of women. One man, one man, another man is adding to that by refusing to pass the bill that I wrote the Violence Against Women Act that has been renewed year after year after year when it's expired. So um, I have tried to maintain, you asked the question, how can we do it, women in the United States Congress, others in the United States Congress who are there, uh, who look like we're in the midst of um, uh, fire. Uh, it is every day we're meeting and reminding ourselves of the major burden that we have, that we don't consider a pain, a burden to put it back together, to not let them get the best of us, them, not let them get the best of us, let America get the best of us, forgive me for this, but we live it every day and I still have to push forward to carry that 69 fever that, that, that colleague, that they weren't colleagues, fellow students, that standing out in the midst of 1970 when this university was shut down and opened up to every manner SDS, Weathermen, Black Power, every other group that came, and we survived it. And I'm glad Virginia is here because the Latino women are merging. Native American women are now in the United States Congress for the first time in numbers, but we're, we're, we, were, we were surging because we believe that we could be change makers. If we don't leave here in whatever category of life that we're in and get that little fire uh, so that we can spread it across the nation, uh, I don't want to see us again on the other side of 2020 um, when we should have done our jobs. Forgive me for that editorial comment, but that's what I see. That's what I see. That's what I see. And um, I'm saying let's go together. Let's go together. Yeah. Do you want to add anything before we open it up? We should. <laughs> wait, wait, I want to hear what Laura thinks of Yale students. Oh, I love also, you. Do they also say they're, they're post-feminist? Do they say what? They're post-feminist. Well, they've been post-feminist for a long time. Uh, <laughs> after 2008, things shifted again when very fundamental questions could again be asked. I will say that, you know, Susan Faludi wrote a book about backlash in a right soon after this period of time in which she traced. It's, it, it's not only that we didn't fully do our job or we couldn't keep the burden of it going or people got hurt in those times and actually also needed a break. All kinds of things happen at a time like that. There was active resistance. There were there are students at Yale who we know were being advised well, you don't want to, don't major in what women's studies. You don't want to have anything to do with that. You don't. And that went on for a really long period of time. And in 2008, there was a palpable shift where students really wanted to know why, you know, why, what the, why the crisis happened, why their parents or the parents of their roommates lost their house, what there was to do about it, began to ask this, those fundamental questions again. So I don't think the students are post-feminist here now. They were. It was very hard to talk to them. What happens is what you described, going out, they go out to work and they come back and they say, oh my God, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> and we, and we, and we say, yeah, yeah, and we say, well, you know, we're here. <laughs> we're here, we were here. Um, I think there's something very important about that. I honor that, actually. Young people come to Yale with dreams. Some of them dream that things will be easier for them because of Yale. Some of them dream this is a magic palace with all of these stone buildings, and it will change their lives. I, that dream has to be honored. That dream gets broken and feminism has to be there, both to honor the wish to transcend the contradictions and pains of our society, 
and to be there to say, well, no, now you see that didn't work. That's okay. Let's see what other people have thought about it. So I don't think it's a post-feminist time, at least at Yale. I think people are disgruntled. I think they feel um, that things are not working out right. <laughs> they are, they're right about that. But I don't any long, I think post-feminism, at least in the classes that I get near, um, isn't there. Do you want to add anything briefly? I want to make sure we get to the crowd. Well, just, just kind of briefly, I mean, maybe one way of phrasing the unfulfilled goal. Uh, so looking back at the Harvard and Radcliffe, or the entry of the relatively small number of women into Yale, so the default mode, of course, was male. And male was the norm, and women were the deviation from the norm. And maybe, you know, the smart girls in high school now and girls run things in high school now, uh, they don't grow up thinking that they are not the norm, that to be a woman is not the norm. But they'll find that out pretty quickly, that the default mode is male. We're seeing that play out in our politics now and so on. So maybe a, 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 a goal that we can draw from our own lived experience going forward is to try to create a world where uh, the default mode is to be an adult person in the world, and it's not the assumption that, uh, that it's, it's, the, it's the male leadership, it's the male running the, running the show. And, and, and I think that was uh, certainly probably what most of us felt and what many of us <laughs> learned in the real world once we, once we left the Ivy League. Um, so I want to take the chance now to open up the conversation. I uh, have two requests. Um, one is that you introduce yourself and maybe your, your, your year from Yale. Um, two is that particularly given the nature of the topic, we avoid uh, making long political speeches um, and maybe, uh, and we'll try to take a few uh, questions and comments um, in a group and then open it up to response up here. Um, are there any... No. Any hands? Yeah, we have one starting out right here in the middle. I think there's a microphone. Wait, there's there's a, a microphone, microphone coming there's your a way. Mic coming. I, I loved your last comment about maybe... Could you introduce yourself? Uh, uh, Judy Silberstein, Brantford, 72. I loved your last comment about maybe it won't be about women or men in the world, but adults. It, could you comment on what the change now is in what it means to be an adult? Because I don't think, even though we're in a more male-normed adult world, it, the male isn't the same male that was back in our day or our parents' day or our grandparents' day. And particularly those of you who think about gender and sexuality, what does it mean to be a non-gendered adult today versus at another time? Wait, are there any other queries? The question. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, no, wait a second. Wait. Let's just get a couple oh. of comments and then we'll and then we'll open it up. Hi. Um, I just want to amp. Thank you for your question. Oh, I'm Patricia Joyce Smith Carter, and I've worked under all those names, so that's why I named them all. Um, Morse, 1971. Um, I want to amplify on her question. I'm kind of wondering how or if that passion that we all had in the 1969 when we came here still exists. And I'm also very troubled. I mean, I feel strongly that we should have a feminist movement, but I also feel that men, and I'm not a man, so I can't make them do this, but I would love to see men exploring what it means to be a man. You know, I mean, I, I'm seeing bullying, I'm seeing intimidating, I'm seeing predatory behavior, and to me, that's not a man. And I wish men would start to ask if that, if that can be something they look at. Okay. We had one more hand right there. Yeah, I'm Julia Preston, class of 1973. My question is about women and power. Uh, our activism was anti-establishment in 1969, civil rights movement, 
the Black Power Movement, we were on the outside hurling ourselves against established power. And I feel like, to a certain extent, that framed our activism and our participation for throughout our lives. And so my question, I have a question for the Congresswoman, which was, at what moment and why did you understand that your role was to gain political power? And anyone else who wants to answer that question, Nancy Vickers, for example, how were the women at Bryn Mawr thinking about their relationship with political power? How important was it to have political power? Where do we stand on that today? All right, maybe let's start with that question, and then we'll hear some more reflections about men, masculinity, um, but either Nancy Vickers or Congresswoman. Um, you know, there, there still remain to this day many great virtues to the women's colleges, and uh, one of them is that uh, they do tend to be very politically engaged. Uh, they can be still yet more politically. Mind you, I left Bryn Mawr in 2008, <laughs> so a, a decade has passed. Uh, uh, certainly, the ethos has changed under the weight of social media, uh, but I certainly do see, as I listen to the current president of Bryn Mawr, someone who is working hard with an enormous amount of forward pressure uh, in terms of making the college a politically more responsible and more active place. So, um, so consequently, I think, uh, you know, at least within that cohort, they are graduating strong, they have great ambitions, and many of those ambitions are political. I thank you for the question. I thank you for the question. I think um, it, it was, you know, there, there are many um, spheres of, of, of influence and power, and certainly for a long time, um, Yale drove people toward the corporate boardroom and corporate America. Uh, and um, you wound up on Wall Street, and you move money around. And that was Yale's one of one of Yale's uh, pathway, along with Ivy Leagues in general. Um, uh, academics academics came in, and um, social policy came in. But I, I think in getting out of Yale and, and going on to uh, law school and beyond, and back home, uh, one began to see uh, that uh, change came by someone uh, having money to change, uh, to make a change, but it also came by engagement and changing the political construct. And so just to make a difference, I, I think, uh, was my viewing uh, the political process as one to be engaged in. Now, um, politics comes in many forms. It didn't hit me really early on because as a lawyer, I wanted to just assume the bench and be quiet and, uh, you know, proceed on as something that I, I loved. Um, it was um, a series of uh, ironic circumstances after I relocated. Um, the uh, death of uh, Mickey Leland, a uh, congressperson who had uh, a, a major focus on uh, helping the uh, unempowered in Africa and died in Africa trying to um, provide uh, food uh, to starving Ethiopians and Eritreans. But in any event, that set my pathway of opportunity to become elected. Just by having to come uh, behind that tragedy in our community, I just knew that I wanted, whatever I did, I wanted to make sure someone's life was better. Um, and I still see that in young people today. They, they are not... Um, I think what they miss is having gone through what we went through and what we know and what we see, and I think it's our obligation to teach them. But my, I was framed by my exposure to Barbara Jordan. I was framed uh, by my exposure to Shirley Chisholm in perspective, uh, by um, uh, Congresswoman Schroeder out of uh, Colorado. I sat next to her as only one other member, two, there were three of us on the Judiciary Committee, three women when I came, and they told me that I wasn't going to be on any other committee but Judiciary because my predecessor, uh, one of my predecessors, Barbara Jordan, was on uh, the Judiciary Committee. 
we went through what we call partial birth abortion. That's how long I've been. That was the attack on something so outrageous. But we as the women, we were called names, um, ridiculous names, because we were the ones, as, you know, just going against these men about how ridiculous it was for you to try to outlaw a medical procedure. I, I'm just using this to say that helped gel me even more. So I think you do have to have experiences to say, uh, I've got to grab power in some way, and I've got to be good about that power so that I can do good things. Um, and I think anyone in here should think about that even more now, because I, I, I really believe our, our going in and out of feminism, our having it, then moments where people say, well, why, why are you, when we, we're, we're equal. Um, I think now more than ever, we need to be teachers as well as actors and uh, purveyors of the truth. We need to be activists. We need to be politically empowered. But for me, it was, how do I change? How do I be a change maker? Even as a young mother, how do I be a change maker? And um, we need more people thinking, how can I be a change maker and use political uh, power, but have your life experience be part of that political power. I think we will be better for it as a nation. Can I can I add something? Um, this is not in disagreement, but um, Julie, I think you said wasn't our passion anti-establishment? Anti-establishment. Yeah. Right, I, I understand that, but can you think of a period of time, including now, when that is not, when, when there isn't a reason to be anti-establishment? We don't use the terminology, but I mean, really? I'm sorry, in, in this group, really? Who's in power in this country? Yes, I know. So why then and not now? I haven't figured it out. Backlash, maybe, but I haven't figured it out. Do it, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Do you want to reflect on uh, some of the earlier questions as well? Well, I'll just say, I mean, there's many ways, we all have different ways we can exercise power, uh, not only in, in overt politics, but, you know, we, we, we live in politics. And I'll just say, my daughter is a filmmaker, and she um, has a big project going, and they were supposed to film in the state of Georgia, which has a billion-dollar film industry because they give deep tax breaks to uh, film producers. And Georgia passed this horrible anti-abortion law a few months ago, and my daughter said, actually, um, I'm not taking this $20 million project to Georgia. Uh, I refuse to go there. And the whole thing had to pick up and go to Calgary, Alberta. Uh, so, you know, that was an exercise of power. Right. Right.